Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. It's, it's great to see so many of you here today, obviously encouraged by intelligent machines. So uh, I think I'm looking forward to the discussion already. Um, just a few things before I announce our speaker for tonight. And there is a couple of notices, one for you in the room, and a couple of notices for those of you who are on online. So for those of you in the room, should the fire alarm go, and it hasn't in the last 10 years I've been here, uh, so I'm sure it won't happen tonight, but if it does, if you could just retrace your steps, walk very calmly and collectively in the down the stairs, out of the main building, turn right, and then turn right again at the end of the road and assemble at Chapel Green, where we can then all take your names. That's really all for the audience in the room. Uh, for those of you online, uh, just to let you know, please remain muted and have your cameras off during the presentation, uh, and then uh, feel free to unmute and show your videos uh, during the Q&A session. And there's three ways of asking a question online. One is to obviously just as I do now, just raise your hand and I shall try and pick you out and, and uh, you can ask your question of the speaker. Alternatively, you can raise your hand electronically in Zoom and I shall try to identify you and you can ask your question that way. And the third way is uh, for you to uh, put your question observations in the chat room. And then I, I can then read it out for, for the speaker later on. And that's really all there is to know, just for the audience, both online and here in the room. This will be recorded, this talk, and hopefully, uh, depending on how it goes, will be available on the BLSI YouTube channel in about four weeks' time. But without further ado, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce to you an expert in artificial intelligence. Uh, Nello Cristianini is the Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of Bath, having been poached by University of Bath from Bristol University, where he was previously. And uh, before that, you've been to the University of London and also at the University of Trieste. Now, clearly, he's going to share with us today uh, details and insights from his most recent book, which has only just really been published, The Shortcut, How Machines Became Intelligent Without Thinking in a Human Way. So that will be really interesting because uh, there has been so much news about artificial intelligence, chat GPT, and what's going on with that over the last six months. Jeff Hinton, the uh, grandfather of Google AI resigning and, uh, and uh, warning us uh, Stability AI CEO on Laura Kunzberg on Sunday, also uh, voicing potential issues we need to grapple with in terms of artificial intelligence. Not to mention people like uh, Mr. Musk and Mr. Hawking, who've also made similar statements in the past. But this is really about not just the doomsters and the gloomsters, as Boris Johnson would say. Tonight is very much about what artificial intelligence actually is and how we need to think about artificial intelligence and the kind of considerations we need to really explore. So it is with great pleasure that I hand you over to Professor Nello Cristianini. Thank you. And thank you for putting me in front of the green screen, Andreas. There are students in Bath who are already planning what to do with it. Green screen image. <laughs> they know how to use it. Um, so yes, it is such a pleasure to be here. I started in Bath a few months ago, but I, I spent a lot of my free time in Bath throughout as a student and as a professor in Bristol. This is such a happy place for me. And. Um, Today, I will try to talk about artificial intelligence in a way that is neither utopian nor dystopian. I really do dislike both discourses and uh, I prefer to get things done if I can instead. So here it is. It looks like if you listen to the media that uh, artificial intelligence only just started this year. All the journalists and politicians seems to have taken notice about 
Uh, that is not for me. That is for Andreas. Sharpening. Maybe the, is it too blurry for you? Andreas is on the case already. Maybe the next slide is written in black. How about this? No? Sorry, I, I think I will read everything. There is nothing worth, worth reading there. I will tell you what is in there. Um, so it actually hasn't started everything this year. Actually, AI hasn't started with ChatGPT and the University of Bath has had a program in artificial intelligence for a long time. And um, even the concerns we have about how to deal with the risks of AI aren't new also. And there is being a PhD program specifically dedicated to dealing with those concerns here up the hill in the university for many years now. But somehow in the general media, this is the year when AI seems to have happened. So let's understand how we can think about it. And um, I think that the right way is to realize this is not something that has come on its own. It is the result of decisions we made, choices we made, and um, the steps that we took to build this current version of AI can teach us a lot about what we can do to live safely with it. So it is worth spending time on the history of how these things happen. And believe me, there is no realistic way to imagine a world in the future without AI, to be honest. And um, I know there is a flyer on, on these chairs about the world in 2050. I'm not sure how it will be, but I'm pretty sure that there will be computers doing intelligent things in 2050. Um, not only because it would be irresponsible to go back and impossible, but also because we have literally phased out a large amount of infrastructure we, we needed, so we just cannot do it. So let's think about how to live safely with it. Let's understand how we got here. But first, let me engage with you in this question, what is intelligence? Because otherwise, we all talk about different things, and that's part of the fascination. That's part of why the media and why even many of the um, very alarmed entrepreneurs and scientists and politicians can get away with so much because nobody knows what we're talking about. So first, if there is one thing that we must get right tonight is what is intelligence? So um, unless everybody is happy, I will not proceed any further. Who knows this man? Carl Sagan, finally, yes, the normal classes don't, but so he was a, a television astronomer of the days, just like now there may be Brian Cox that was in America in the 70s. He's holding the, the plaque that uh, he designed for the Pioneer 10. When the Pioneer 10 was launched, it was due to leave the solar system. They thought irrationally, what if some alien civilization gets hold of it? And uh, what are they going to know about us? Let's not look bad. Let's make a very clever plaque. And they made this which contains encoded sort of information about a hydrogen molecule and the position of several pulsars and the, the solar system and a bunch of other things that could be decoded apparently by civilization. Uh, the same man, the year after, in 1973, devised a specific radio message that could be broadcast from the radio telescope in, in Arecibo to, to be interpreted by aliens. And it was cleverly designed so that uh, it would be kind of natural to decode it in a specific way, if you know enough mathematics, um, to contain essential information on how to contact us. But you need to know enough mathematics. So he spent ages designing these clever schemes and then giving them to his PhD students in physics and allowing them to decode it, and then coming back and saying, it can be done because my students can do it and because any civilization, any alien intelligence must know the laws of physics and must know the laws of mathematics because they evolved in the same universe as we did. So that was his line of thinking about alien intelligence. So <clears throat> I did the same experiment uh, with my cut 
uh, and um, um, it didn't work. Same universe, same laws of physics, but no interest. And and the, and the point is, I think that uh, Carl Sagan was thinking of something else, not of intelligent agents. And this is an intelligent agent. This is an agent that can pursue its own goals and chase and learn and remember and plan and reason. And does also it evolved in the same universe and family and everything. Even the genome is very close to ours. It is not even an alien. A good alien could be a giant squid from the bottom of the ocean or some crazy crustacean from Antarctica. They are a bit more alien. Even those are not aliens. What is an alien is difficult to imagine for us. That's one of the challenges to think of something fundamentally different from us. Certainly not the cut. And even the cut doesn't know what to make of this message because, because intelligence is not about this kind of reasoning. It is not about math. It is not about writing poetry. It has got nothing to do with Shakespeare. If anything, if anything, intelligence has a lot to do with the chicken crossing the road without being run over and not so much with Shakespeare writing something. So let's understand what, why evolution spent energy in developing intelligent behavior. Here is an example, by the way. Can anybody recognize an intelligent agent in this picture? Incidentally, every picture was generated by AI in this presentation, nearly every, except for Sagan and a few. This was generated by one of those transformers. Anybody can see an intelligent agent? Come on, you can. The philosopher in the room has already spotted it. Have you? I'm used to it. I don't have to go ahead until somebody answers. I do it all the time. Okay, somebody said B. Now, the philosopher thought B. The, the, the bee in the picture is, of course, an intelligent agent. It has got purpose. The purpose is to get sugar, nectar from the flower. And uh, it has decisions to make. It has information to process. It is using eyes and antenna and sensors of all sorts, gathering information in the, in the environment to make a decision. I'm landing on that flower or on that flower because there is more or less sugar here. But the plant itself is also an intelligent agent. The plant has a different need. It has to spread its pollen, but it cannot walk about. So it can't go to the next plant 10, kilo, 10 meters away. It has to manipulate its environment by producing the nectar to entice the bee, to uh, use the bee to deliver the pollen to the next plant. That's a way to interact with this environment also. They have different goals and they have different information sources. And the plant, by the way, can decide how to move its leaves and how to grow its roots. The plant makes so many decisions. When to open the flower in the morning, when to make a flower in the spring, decisions are made all the time in the plant. There is a clock, there are decision mechanisms in the bee, in the plant, everywhere. Um, so the key is, what is intelligent behavior? This is concept number one today. The, this is a bit boring, but the psychologist, Jean Piaget, uh, know what to do when we do not know what to do. If you know what to do, you just have to have memory and have a list of things that so you just act. But if you are in a new situation, never seen before, now you have to think about it and make a plan where there is no plan. And that is where intelligence starts becoming interesting. You can say behaving in a proper way when there is no script. So that's a picture of a bird making a decision between which of the two berries is more promising. The goal could be again to get sugar, which one is most interesting? So the bottom line and the conclusion of this part is intelligence existed on this planet before the first human being. It has got nothing to do with being human. It, uh, it doesn't require language or logic or anything of the sort. Probably not even a brain. So just to dispel a lot of expectations, intelligence is something else. It's doing that stuff, behaving in a proper way making the right decisions when you don't have, having not seen the same situation before. Good. So in this way, this kind of intelligence can be put in machines and, it, and we have them. It is this sort of intelligence. You can filter a new email message never seen before. You can translate a new document never seen before. You can recommend a new video to a new user or you can detect pneumonia in an X-ray or you can um, decide whether you grant a loan to an applicant in the bank. All people and documents never seen before, you don't have a 
lookup list of actions, you have to work it out. We are surrounded by this kind of intelligence. You put a person in front of YouTube for the first time, YouTube will interact with them for a few attempts. And before too soon, before too late, the machine will, will start making decisions that are meaningful and improve with experience until it will accomplish its goal of keeping the person clicking. TikTok is very good at it, I, I hear. And TikTok is making use of uh, hundreds of information sources to pursue the goal of keeping the user there clicking. So we need to learn how to recognize the artificial intelligences that we encounter every day because they are so difficult to recognize because we are expecting something else. That is why Carl Sagan couldn't imagine a different type of alien. He was imagining something that looks like us. And when Alan Turing invented the Turing test, he was imagining a conversation. And when the first pioneers of AI built the first machines, the first thing they did was to build a theorem proving machine because in their mind, the highest thing that you can do in terms of intelligence is to prove theorems. That was the viewpoint of a mathematician, of course. And so for a long time, we tried to emulate what we think humans do. And I will tell you that this is not the way things went and we we're going to see it, but please let's acknowledge first that for a long time also, not only do we have intelligent algorithms, for a long time also we have problems. And uh, again, this doesn't start in 2023 or with today's Senate hearing in the US, which looked like they finally discovered something may be going wrong. We have known this for a long time. In fact, these pictures refer to what I call the panics of 2016. That was a year in which a lot of things uh, went wrong. Is this Andrea? So is it one of is this one of us making this noise? No. Oh, no, no, I'm not. It is not. Um, but anyway, something is making noise. Um, okay, anything else? Um, so this is the topic, right? How we make intelligent machines, what can go right, what can go wrong. This is the kind of stuff we worry about, addiction, surveillance, um, persuasion, and so on. Discrimination. Good. Why should we even bother? My point is we should bother because we have to live with this stuff and we should live in a safe manner. We can't opt out. This is coming or it has come. And uh, the more we know about it, the better we can think about it, the better laws we can make. There is one law being pretty much finalized in Brussels now it will be voted in June. Um, other laws have been made in the US and in this country, of course. And they're all very similar. That's the good news. They all look like each other, showing that these people talk to each other probably. Um, so the way we understand how our machines think, so to speak, is to understand how we got here. So that's the next, the story of the three shortcuts. I'll try and be more efficient now. So that is how we used to do science. And in the past for AI, but we still do science normally. You first do a theory, first understand the phenomenon. Let's say you want to build a bridge. You understand the material science, you understand the statics, and then you design your bridge. If you want to build a, a canal, you understand the fluid dynamics, and then you build your canal. Uh, if you want to, build an airplane, same story, you understand the physics. So that, that was the most natural start for anybody trying to build a system to understand the language, for example. Well, first understand the language, then implement it in a computer and then try to make it translate. Um, so it turns out that despite decades of work on grammar and linguistics, everything that we knew about human language was encoded in, in an immense amount of theory. None of that produced viable translations or summaries or question answering. It just didn't work, which is also something that the linguistic, linguistics people should consider seriously. We don't have in our pockets 
a machine translation tool in the telephone that is based on linguistics. It just didn't work. Although we do love to think in terms of grammar and syntax and semantics and the entire castle we constructed and we, we like so much, it doesn't deliver. And at some point, after decades of frustration, someone decided to just forget the big question of understanding how language works. Let's just focus on blocking spam emails. Well, it turns out blocking spam emails is so much easier than understanding how human language works or completing the sentence on WhatsApp when you're trying to dial your message and the machine just knows the rest of the world. How does it know? Philosophers will say, well, potentially you could have said anything. Yes, you could have said anything, but you don't because you're human. And after you said 17 words, number 18 is pretty much determined by the previous 17. Um, so it is possible to make predictions about spam and the completing sentences and translating documents even without understanding the meaning of a document. And that's interesting. And there is a moment when this actually happened. And this person is called Frederick Yerinek. He is a, the one who started the machine translation in the modern way called the statistical machine translation in the 80s. And he succeeded. He decided, can't I just statistically analyze the makeup of a sentence and see if it looks like a valid English sentence or not? Can I predict the missing word or not? And um, he was asking much simpler questions. And he became famous for saying that sentence on the, on the balloon. That every time I fire a linguist, our performance goes up. He became pluridecorated. decorated. Uh, he was awarded every possible prize for computational linguistics. He solved also the problem of speech recognition, which is dictation. And uh, his work, he named it a statistical language model, a model of language that is based on statistics, not on grammar. Remember that expression because we are coming to that at the end of the talk, we are going to talk about statistical language models. That is where they come from, Jelinek. Um, and this gentleman, uh, I, I remember meeting him in London when I was a student. He had this nice sentence, which applies to spam emails. He would say, uh, he's called Vladimir Babnik, and he's from Russia. Uh, in solving a problem of interest, do not solve a more general problem as an intermediate step. Solve the problem you need to solve, not the general one. In fact, it is not a shortcut to solve something harder. If you have to go from here to the, to the pub, you don't want to build a car and then find, discover oil, and then put the oil in the, the gas in the car, and then finally go to the pub. You can just walk to the pub. Mm -hmm. That was his philosophy about everything. Why do you want to understand language? Oh, any other topic. You can just do it quicker. That mindset from Yerinek to Vapnik spread around the entire field of artificial intelligence. The idea is you can learn how to do things by observing data and copying the statistics of data. That is what we call machine learning. And machine learning became the way we do artificial intelligence. And it changed the way we translated in the 80s. That is how you block spam now. But that also entered in companies like Amazon. And by 1997, they had a complete team of humans who were in charge of making recommendations and book reviews for the readers. And, uh, and people loved it. They used to call it the voice of Amazon in those days. And it was copied uh, on the style of the New York Review of Books. And it was just a general, very clever discussion of each book that they actually had to read. Well, it turns out, that uh, the, the volume was too high and they decided to try and recommend books automatically. And they realized it's not difficult to recommend the books automatically. And they even decided they can do it in a personalized fashion. And they developed methods to recommend the books to every single individual. At that point, the founder of Amazon in 1997 was uh, Jeff Bezos, came up with this expression, I want a different bookshop for every customer. Remember this, it will come back also. Personalization, to the extreme. Every customer has a different book shop. Imagine Mr. B, as soon as you walk into Mr. B, they rearrange the shelves for you. And then somebody else walks in and they rearrange the shelf. Or you go to the restaurant and the menu is being modified for you. That's the experience Jeff Bezos wanted and had because Amazon does that. You can sell books without understanding anything about the book or the person. You can still do it. And, and that's the lesson. So a side note, how does GPT get trained? I can tell you the, already now, 
ChatGPT is a statistical language model, much like the ones created by Jelinek. And how do we train it? With a system of masking words and training the machine to guess the missing word, which has got a lot of benefits in practice. And this is a very classic test in psychology. In the Gestalt psychology, this is called the closed test. The, the assumption is if a child in class can complete the missing words, they must be able to understand the meaning of the document. And that's why you test them in this way for understanding. Well, that's the way, by the way, I put it in Italian first because I'm lazy and I'm using this in Italy, but also because that is the same experience the machine has. The machine has no idea of what you're talking about. It literally sees that. Imagine this written in Finnish if you're not Finnish, right? The machine has that every day. It sees a stream of stuff that can't possibly understand. I test to be able to predict the missing word. Okay, maybe somebody speaks Italian, but the point is, what if it was written in Vietnamese and nobody here speaks Vietnamese? So um, that's how we train it. The model can predict the missing words. That is what people called at some point, the end of theory. Of course, it was seen as a negative thing. We don't need theory anymore. We can make predictions without understanding and making theoretical statements. That came maybe 10 years ago. Some people called it even the unreasonable effectiveness of data. There is a great paper 10 years ago by Google researchers with this title, just discussing why data is so effective in making good predictions without understanding anything. And that's a place for any good philosopher of science to pause and reflect on the meaning of knowledge. Here we have decoupled the act of making a prediction from the act of understanding or explaining what we are doing. They used to come together. They would ask a scientist, why do you want to understand the gravitation? Because if I understand gravitation, I can make predictions about when the next asteroid will hit. Okay, how about you can make the same predictions with no understanding? What's the role of understanding theory today when predictions come in a different way? You know, that's an important moment for, for Western culture that is depending so much on theory. And um, it's very disappointing, but they can translate and recommend and they can do other things. And by the way, I don't say they don't understand because I'm, I'm coming to the belief that there is some sort of understanding going on, but they don't understand on our tabs. So there can be no communication. That means it is not interpretable fundamentally by us. It cannot be represented in human worlds. I believe some of the concepts the machine can use to recommend the books just don't have a name in our language. And nevertheless, they're very useful concepts. And that I can't explain, but it, I spent an entire chapter of my little book called The Shortcut, chapter three, on that point. There can be things that we cannot understand. So, that was shortcut number one. We replace everything with statistics, but then there has to be a data. And finding data is not so easy. Finding data has a cost. I remember uh, very well, sadly, the days before the web existed, finding data is a problem. You have to go and make measurements. You have to, if it's about people, you have to make surveys, you have to interview people or make photos. Data has a cost and maybe it's correct. Maybe we should pay for data. When you do a clinical trial to measure the effectiveness of COVID vaccines, you recruit people, you visit them, you assess them, you, you spend money for data. But this was too much data. And, uh, and data became the fuel to fuel everything. Everybody wanted data. It became the, the world's most valuable resource, according to The Economist, data. The new oil, they called it, data. Billions of examples are needed to train GPT. I mean, hundreds of billions of documents are needed. The entire web is being used to train GPT-4. Well, so the shortcut number two was let's recycle data, just recycle it. Newspapers, web pages, Wikipedia, discussion, forums, people arguing, emails, whatever you find is scrape of the web. Surely you can learn the meaning of words from discussion groups. You can learn the meaning of sentences from discussion groups. And that was the assumption without paying for it. It's a great shortcut. In this case, we have pictures of digits. Guess how you get digits? That's really old fashioned. You take images of envelopes where people write postcodes. Remember those days? People wrote postcodes on envelopes and you can scan them and harvest digits. So that will be a resource also because it's finite resource. I don't know how long for this is going to happen, but for the time being, we have access to postcodes. 
So this is called data from the wild. Shortcut number one, do statistics. Don't need to understand the theory. Just make statistical predictions based on data. Harvest data from the wild. Whatever is out there, exploit. Rather than hoping for something you don't have, use what you do have. Um, and now there is a, a slogan you can hear in, in students' world, really, or the young researchers' world. Intelligence begins at one billion examples. I still remember the day in the 90s when one of my colleagues in, in, in Wisconsin first trained a learning algorithm on one million. And I was astonished I could understand how you can train this on one million examples. That would be laughable today. One billion is what you need to begin. Uh, but you don't pay for it. Data is free. Third problem, how does the agent know what you want from it? How does it know what is a good movie, a funny joke, or a nice song? How does it know? It can't give you a form. Even first, you wouldn't even answer it. You wouldn't fill the form. But how do you explain in objective formulas what is a funny joke? So, and also you don't want to. So it turns out that it's quicker and cheaper to just observe people and see what they click and remember it. And the assumption is, the assumption is that just like in the economics theory, uh, consumers, uh, someone saw in the, in the classical year one book of economics would say, consumers reveal their preferences by, by consuming. Um, the assumption here is the users reveal their preferences by clicking. You just see what they want. And uh, that became the third shortcut. Do statistics, harvest data from the wild, observe people and assume they reveal their preferences by clicking. That's it. You put them together, you put them together, you have a strange place where the machine keeps on looking at you and reading everything and learning whatever it knows from the web and trying to make predictions all the time. On the other hand, you don't pay for anything and the machine works. And it works better than the best things we had before. So all these are assumptions, are shortcuts, and everything in life has consequences. And there are consequences to this course of action, even though there was not probably another, another path. So gold medal for AI. And this is a, funny because I tried to get Dali, the software, to write AI on the medal, and it just cannot seem to be able to do it. It cannot count. So it keeps on putting two eyes. And I say, no, put one eye. And it keeps on having two. And that's a large language, statistical language model for you. But the point is, as soon as you built it, we also deployed it at the very center of the digital, digital infrastructure that we use for everything. It is AI that checks your credit card transactions. It is AI that stops your unwanted email. It is AI that recommends videos on YouTube or chooses what you see on Instagram or Facebook, the news you get. It is always AI doing that. And they're in that strategic position. They can both see you and they can influence you. And it's part of the revenue model too, because the more they see you, the more they can advertise and so on. So some would say, what could possibly go wrong when you put something like that in a position like that? Well, surprisingly enough, something can go wrong. And uh, for example, um, there are many anxieties and some are justified and some are not, to be honest, about uh, uh, political campaigning based on uh, personal information, political targeting based on personal information, surveillance, widespread surveillance, which is obviously possible technically because of the way we built the machine, uh, privacy violations, potential addiction, digital addiction by children because of the highly rewarding nature of what they are exposed to. It, it, it could make it very hard for them to have self-control if they're too young and so on and so forth. So unintended effects. Now, I don't have too much time right now. I want to finish by 8.25. But if there is time, somebody can ask me about the monkey paw, which is something I like to talk about. But every time I skip it. But if it comes, you know. Um, so one of the interesting concerns is when people realize that these machines are also asked to make decisions that are quite meaningful. In the US, there is a software making decisions about releasing a prisoner on parole. That is something I don't believe we have even here, but there is a notion being released on parole. There is a test they do. They ask them questions and then there is a software making a decision. If somebody decided to investigate, is this software treating the same way uh, Americans that are black or those that are white? And in that article, they claim the, the algorithm was a bit biased in, against the black um, African-Americans. 
Um, there are also studies that show that um, women are shown job ads for lower paid jobs than men on average. I, I haven't reproduced, I just noticed these articles. Others um, claim that the software just translates in a very biased way. Um, if you translate into Italian, the sentence, the doctor and the nurse met the senator and the babysitter. In English, it's just neutral. Uh, but you would have a male doctor and a female nurse and a male senator and a female babysitter auto automatically. If you say the pilot and the flight attendant are going to work, you can bet that the pilot is a man and the flight attendant. Because in Italian, every single word is gendered. So in English, you don't notice this, but the machine has to learn something from the world. And the world is, looks like this today. And the machine is just learning, not just grammar, but the usage of language. And so even if it's only words, the concern is what if this kind of approach is used to screen CVs and start making decisions about applicants for works based on the same type of biases. And it's a major concern. It is not the only one, but it is one that caught with the political attention a lot. So the racism concern, the psychological persuasion concerns, this company Clearview does something insane. They're harvesting everybody's face from the web without their consent. And then they're selling the service of face recognition to police's, police forces around the world. They are boasting that they have 3 billion images scraped. Fake news circulated during 2016 and they were recommended only to some people. So some people never found them and some people saw only those and so on. And um, there is a lot that, that should be understood better. Many of these things are the direct result of the shortcuts. If an algorithm is built so that they find whatever news item will make you click, it will specialize in finding those words and expressions that make you click. When you ask, can you please stop spreading false information? The expression is meaningless because the machine isn't built in terms of truth and, 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 and falseness. It is built for clickability. So there is no place in the machine to represent the notion of true statement. It is just a clickable statement and so on and so forth. And um, so the very same shortcuts that gave us all the benefits are also the very same shortcuts that make it so hard to manage, which is good for a fairy tale, isn't it? And, um, and now we are trying to untangle this mess. And there are lots of people and Bath is a complete training center on this mess that must be untangled pretty fast. And um, it can get worse. I mean, in, in, in the terrible story of Molly Russell last year, that, um, it was a tragic story of a child who, who, who died tragically. The coroner found in a written report that uh, the, 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 the algorithm recommended contents that she had not requested about self-harm, uh, which played some role in her death. So that is the summary of the story. It was the first time I saw actually a legal decision by a coroner blaming a recommender algorithm for something so tragic. And I think we need to make sure this is not happening ever again to anybody. And there are so many studies that I can't list here, but you will find in you know, the book about what we know so far, which is not as much as we should in terms of the psychological effects of exposure to these machines. So these machines can learn our preferences or perhaps our weaknesses. They can absorb our ideas and inclinations and biases. They can remember everything and they can influence our behavior that has been proven. They can actually successfully nudge people in different directions. And I wish I had time to describe how we know that without understanding what they're doing. They do it because it gives them, takes them towards their goal, the goal, the goal of making people click and so on. So that's where we are today. This was to before GPT existed. This is not needed chat GPT or anything of the sort. Chat GPT came after, and it's a very successful algorithm that is also based on the very same three shortcuts of using data from the wild statistical relations and observing users. And it doesn't, and it, it, it is not immune from the same concerns. If anything, it's more powerful. So the question becomes, how do we coexist with all this without harming anyone? Um, 
and it's an interesting question to ask. Uh, I think it's a valid question to ask. So first we must recognize that these machines do not think like us, which means instead of asking them to do something fundamentally impossible, like giving me a complete explanation of their decisions or listening to my rant about equality, let's understand how they work. And it doesn't mean they're not intelligent. So the only way I can explain it is if you have a garden like I do and you get a swarm of grasshoppers, and they don't come here very much, but I remember when they came to my other garden. They are intelligent. They know what they want. They can figure out how to have it. You can't get rid of them. You cannot talk to them. You can't explain them that what they do is not right. They just aren't built in this way. It doesn't mean they're not intelligent. They have a different type of intelligence. They are a swarm of grasshoppers. So we should start thinking about the things we build a bit like this. They are intelligent machines. They learn, they decide, they plan, they reason, and they pursue goals. Not in the way we do it. There is not talking to them. But this might help us think about them. Um, I think it's an alien type of intelligence. It is the most alien thing we have, actually, because everything has actually evolved in the same planet with us, but this thing didn't. It's the most alien thing we built, we can encounter, actually. It is not anthropomorphic. Um, mm -hmm. But the point is that we had a very interesting philosophical shift, if you are one of those people like me who cares about the origin of ideas. Again, I remember Vapnik, the theoretician of machine learning, when I was in London as a student, repeating this. He would say, Einstein used to say, and it's true, Einstein did say, I'm not interested in smaller things. I just want to know God's thoughts. That was Einstein. The rest are just details, you know, like the final grand theory of everything. Einstein was not notoriously bad at simple mathematics and getting small things computed. He was brilliant in understanding the big picture. But Vapnik has a very different mindset. I would call it a postmodern mindset. He says, my question is, how do I act well without understanding God's thoughts? How do we make the right predictions without knowing the theory behind the world? Maybe there is no theory behind the world. I still have to act somehow. That's the essence of my theory, he said. I think that mindset is fundamentally what powers today's AI. How to make the right actions without understanding the context, the meaning, the theory behind it. It's quite a powerful moment when we started going down that path. Now I can, I cannot stop making comics so I can make so many comics. This is Ada Lovelace, you know, uh, this is a, the first programmer and uh, she was the collaborator of Charles Babbage. This institution is so old, she might even have been here, who knows. In 1843, she, um, she translated, um, it's a long story, but the only, the, the first mechanical computer that actually could have worked if they if they'd finished building it was the analytical engine of Charles Babbage. Only half was built. You can see that half in, in the Science Museum in London. It was never completed, but we know the plans. We know how it was meant to be, and we know it would have worked. It would have been a general purpose computing machine in 1840. And then she was uh, this incredible lady, and she was also a collaborator of Babbage, and she um, spoke French. So at some point, the only written description of this man's work was in French because he presented it in Turin, where I'm going the day after tomorrow, but I will speak Italian. And he, in Turin in those days, people spoke French. So the entire book was transcribed into French and there was a French language description of, of this engine. And so Lady Lovelace was asked to translate it into English and she did very well but she added her own personal comments, which are brilliant, all of them. And in one of the notes, um, she has this nice thing, a machine can do what we know how to order it to do, which is a nice reassuring idea. She didn't mean it in a very deep way. The machine can do whatever I can order it to do. Actually, the quotations are on, a machine can do whatever we know how to order it to do. And uh, we all took it to mean the machine will do whatever I can explain, but that's all it can do. And that's probably not, I don't know if it's what you meant, but can the machines do something that its maker doesn't understand? 
That's the question. Can the machine do something its maker cannot explain? Uh, the programmer, you know, the programmer or the, the writer of the software. Well, it turns out that in 2016 in London, uh, somebody built a software that can beat the world champion of Go, the, the board game. And this machine uh, can beat every one of its programmers, the world champion, and the, its own makers cannot un explain the logic behind its moves. Nevertheless, it can play very well. So after publishing the article, uh, Demis Asabis, the founder of DeepMind, honestly said, uh, the machine works so well because it is no longer constrained by the limits of human knowledge. For him, it was just a statement for me. It's a quite a meaningful moment. We were holding the machine back. We are forcing it to go through human-made concepts until AlphaGo Zero was made. It was no longer constrained by that. It was entirely free to do whatever it wanted, and it learned a fundamentally different way to think about the game. I think we must be ready for that. Machines will learn fundamentally different ways to do things. In some cases, they will become superhuman, like the Go player. They will know things we do not know how to order them to do. It doesn't mean they're going to be general intelligence. This is an expression that people use a lot out of context. There is not such a thing as general intelligence. If you think universal, there is no a universal type of intelligence. There is no time to describe why, but people use this deliberately in ambiguous manners. Artificial general intelligence is used in many ways. The best you can hope for is a fairly broad machine that does a bunch of things uh, that matter to us. And so from our point of view, it's very general. Um, but they will do it in a way that we can't explain. And I think that those days are not far at all. Surely before the 2050 future that uh, this institution will discuss this year, surely before then. And yet we can't unplug. So it wouldn't be possible. It wouldn't be responsible. There is no way of getting rid of this. The good coming from it is significant. Imagine um, uh, somebody operating in, in a faraway country with no doctors, and yet they can diagnose a skin lesion by using a photograph. Or imagine um, a nurse being able to read an X-ray an X-ray automatically and making a diagnosis of pneumonia. Or imagine when I had to write my previous book, I had to access Slovenian language and, and German language uh, newspapers from a hundred years ago, and they were kept in Vienna and in Ljubljana. And nevertheless, with zero cost, I was able to read and translate automatically Viennese and Slovenian newspapers of the past, zero cost. All that has an incredible power, potentially, to remove inequalities. Imagine some child in a faraway country with a single internet connection doing the same thing at the same cost of zero. And, and the learning, you know, the, the situation is the machine can make us do incredible things, yet it can also be a problem. So we can't go back, first, technically, second, it would be insane. And third, we are in a competition. No company, no country can stop because the others wouldn't stop. So we are caught in this situation and we are going to go forward. The question is, we must make it safe and respectful and responsible. And this is not so much for the engineers to do, but it is for the lawmakers to do. This is a matter of making the right laws. And before that, of understanding what we built. So we started with a clear shopping list in the 50s. We delivered every single item, everything in the proceedings of the early conferences. I have a brilliant set of proceedings from Teddington, 1958. Every single item in the list has been built and it is today in my telephone. That mission is accomplished. Even uh, the Turing test that Turing discovered in 1950, GPT can pass it. The test was, can you have a conversation with a person and with a machine and not knowing which one is the person, which one is the machine? GPT-3 can do it. So we achieved every single goal. We have now a new list, how to make this safe. And uh, it's not easy. And uh, it has to be done quick by this generation. It cannot wait for the next generation. So it's quite a burden for everybody studying this business today. The mission is this, and then I'll stop. Um, we must make these machines trustworthy, which means safe, reliable, auditable. Nobody should have to worry when they upload their CV about will this machine realize I am female or migrant or anything. 
will I get less points if I write my, my middle name? All that shouldn't be in the mind of a user for a second. And uh, we need to get there. But the laws must be based on what we build. We can't have any more speculations. It's too late for that. Um, if you want to tell you about the monkey paw, otherwise I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much indeed. Please put your hands together for Nello and an excellent presentation. So there's plenty to think about. Uh, we're going to start off with questions in the room first, and then we're going to go to questions online as well. So there's about 70, 80 of us in total, so I'm sure there will be quite a few questions. There's obviously the obvious question, which I'm going to give somebody to, to ask, which has something to do with monkeys and unintended consequences. <laughs> but uh, I won't ask the question, I give that to somebody else. Who wants to ask the first question? This gentleman here. If you speak directly into. Thank you. Do you think there's space for AI based on not the shortcut, or is it too late? It isn't too late. We just don't know how to do it. We 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 really spent an immense amount of money. Uh, it has been tied and tied and tied. It's not for lack of time, and that was a major part of American military spending for so many years. It just doesn't work. Yet. Okay. Yet. If you're looking to kind of design laws to kind of control these statistical models, is there a problem in that you're working in two different domains? Law are, are, is, is kind of built on these logical statements, kind of God's answers in Einstein's mind, but you're trying to regulate statistical systems which don't operate according to any kind of defined Rule, rules. Yeah, so we, I, we wouldn't be making, so there is being a complete school of research, which again is not going very far in my opinion, trying to automate legal reasoning. That does hit that wall. If you have an automated legal reasoning starting from big principles and deducing down, you know, the, the, the decision, the ruling of the judge, that doesn't work. But having general values and principles about how to live with machines, I think it's within reach. For example, the kind of laws we are making now are, um, well, the European Union, the one I studied most recently, you know, they first they made a decision and the decision was, we don't want to uh, stifle innovation because they know that whatever happens in Europe, America and China will do something else potentially and we just fall behind. So how do you walk this line? Well, the idea is that we don't regulate the technology. We, re we regulate the applications of the technology to specific users. That's the principle. So the same exact GPT could be fine in a video game, could be not at all fine in, in a job interview. It would be different levels of risks. And then they break down four levels of risk, unacceptable risk, which is going against the European values and cannot be done. And that includes, as of last week, something. It used to be empty. Now, there are specific things like um, a remote biometrics, for example, which means recognizing people's face from a distance. Um, another principle is the machine must always disclose itself as a machine. It cannot fool a human into thinking, I am a machine, I am a human. That's a principle. And then there is a lower level of risk, which is a very high risk. It must be very, very regulated when you are uh, dealing with the fundamental rights, the right to work, the right to health. If the machine is making decisions about fundamental rights, then it's the burden of the maker and the user to show that it's respecting every single law. So if you want to make a company to select somebody's CV for job applications, you're going to have to prove that the machine doesn't discriminate anybody. And then there is a lower risk, which is small risk with very light touch regulation. And then there is the, the category below in which nobody will bother you. So the idea is let's allow students to make startups. Let's allow everybody to sort out the parking, the parking payments with the AI without bothering them. But when they go into regulating who gets to school and who doesn't get into school, then we want to see the paperwork really well done. So the idea is to keep the innovation going and regulate only some sectors. That's one attempt. 
I think they gave up on requesting an explanation for decisions, which is a part of GDPR, because it's becoming unrealistic to, to request one. I mean, G, GPT will give an explanation, but it's the, just randomly made up on the spot. So it, it doesn't correspond to the, the explanation. So it will be challenging. I think we can do a lot before we find that wall that you say that, that the machines are too messy to be regulated. We, we, can, we can do quite a lot before that. Okay, lost in translation, clearly. Uh, right, another question by this gentleman. Um, where does motivation or drive fit into this? Motivation, uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we carved off uh, a part of uh, human, um, human being, really, uh, or, or of society. But a human being has a body and fits within a social network and with it has a family and so on. So these are driving the actions. What's going to be driving the actions of AI? Or to put it in a different way, if you think of the, uh, the, um, that chess player, which was the original paradigm, uh, and that was you know, a great achievement in its way, but for it to have had human intelligence, it would have been able to have stopped playing, left the board, and to have captain a cricket team. Where does this fit into the broader yeah. spectrum of abilities? So I think it's very, 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 very important to, to realize we are not talking about human intelligence. So that's a very important step because we all think Now, intelligence existed on this planet for sure, before us, unless you want to define it as the one quality that makes humans different from everybody else. Unless you have this ambition, intelligence can be attributed to a hamster, or it can be given to a chicken, or you can find it in all sorts of organisms. I, that's a fundamental, important step. There are many categories that we are mixing, and there is self-consciousness and awareness and, and, and all, you know, sentiment and emotion and so on. We are talking about intelligence. Um, and it's, I, I know we always try to find some reason why humans are special. But uh, remember that uh, in the evolution of life forms, only once that we know there was language and culture, once. Though I, there is no specific reason to imagine machines to ever get there, ever. It is not the destination or the pinnacle of evolution to, to reach that kind of experience. And uh, maybe if you rewind the, the film and try again, maybe we don't get humans. So we are, but it's, a problem. it's the same mindset that made us believe for a long time that our planet is the center of the universe. You know, we are that specific thing. But if we leave aside humans for a moment, we can make a lot of progress on understanding intelligence problem solving, learning, planning, scheduling, reasoning. And I think it's worth doing it and giving it names. And then you can talk about everything which is not that, and you will find poetry, emotion, the human connection, the sense of togetherness, all the things you mentioned that are worth cherishing, but they will be with us even when the machines will be more intelligent than us. They are not a part of intelligence. Well, that's, that is actually quite an interesting question. We, we seem to be intrinsically know what motivates us as a human being, but what motivates the machine apart from clickability? Well, the way we build it now, we actually design it with a goal, right? We build a machine with a goal and the goal is as high as you want it to be. But uh, in the end of the day, the machine measures its progress in terms of whatever goal. If you want to consider machines that have no goal, you will find it hard to distinguish them from any random um, process because there is no way to decide if they are using intelligence. It's, a, it's going to be interesting philosophically to discuss a form of intelligence that has fundamentally no goals or purposes and how you distinguish it from anything else. I have one follow-up question. If, uh, if AlphaGo uh, we don't understand how AlphaGo actually plays. Does that mean AlphaGo and intelligent machines in the future could potentially evolve their own parameters? There are two different questions. Um, 
this is possible even if we do understand how it works. I mean, there is no connection. We don't understand how these things work. We can't explain in our language um, the, the reasons behind their decisions. Nevertheless, the decisions are highly effective. We just can't understand them. And we must make our peace with that also. It was false when they told you that the human mind is the highest thing and the most general thing. It was never true. Psychologists know it. Uh, biologists know it. It is not. It is very easy to imagine things that we cannot comprehend and a machine can. Yeah. Okay. Separately, can the machine evolve its own parameters? Well, that is how it learns, right? The, the, it does evolve its own parameters. It is done. I mean, that's how we train it. So it can establish its own goals. No, it can, in the way we train it, it, it finds its own way to solve the goal it was built for. Good. We've got another question here. Another one in the back. Thank you. Um, just kind of expanding on what you just said there and from Vapnik, the learning process used to be theory and understanding and then modeling for powerful predictions. And now it's powerful predictive modeling and we don't necessarily understand why it makes the predictions it makes. Do you think that there's any value in inference for like a future statistician or data scientist? Well, inference is a very ambiguous word. Do you mean logical inference? Yeah, like logical inference, sorry, okay. yes. Well, it's important to distinguish, right? Because statistical inference, we just discussed all night. Uh, logical inference, in like deduction, for example, because induction is too controversial. Well, there is a, a value in deduction, but it is fully solved. I mean, machines can deduce very well from a long time. It's the first thing we built. So we can deduce. There is a language from the old days called the Prolog that is specifically designed so you can deduce theorems from axioms. And it's an immense amount of fun. I even had to teach it at some point in my life, but I don't know of anything being built with Prolog these days because logic doesn't deal well with contradictions and the world is full of ambiguities and contradictions and, and um, changes of mind along the way and reconsiderations and the logic doesn't deal with it very well. So we try to make a probabilistic logics, fuzzy logics, non-monotonic logics. There was a complete universe in AI, the entire conferences of logic and the entire thing eventually just didn't work. Okay. Yeah. Deduction is possible. Induction is slightly more controversial. So over to our next question. Thank you. Hi. If um, it seems to you, as it seems to me, that we are not significantly much more intelligent now uh, than we were, say, 2,000 years ago, and if you see that artificial intelligences are in contrast, getting more intelligent astonishingly rapidly. Do you see an end point there? Or are we simply on the very early stages of a curve which leads to intelligences far greater than ours, possibly within my lifetime? Yeah, so I, I haven't addressed this in here and I left it for the next one. It's quite a question, isn't it? Uh, because along the journey, you will find very strange characters that you don't want to share your path with, you know, these are not scientists, these are not credible, and they love that place. And yet there is a question to be asked, like you correctly ask, it's a logical, natural question. What happens in the end of this game? Um, oh, what happened? I've unshared the, the, the thing, okay. so we can actually get some people to ask some questions. Oh, okay, I... yes. So um, I don't know if there is, a, and I, don't, I haven't thought about it long enough, and a natural end to how powerful such a machine can become. I don't know. From our point of view, it doesn't even matter. There are some people who have raised, raised this possibility. How seriously, I cannot tell. And the concern they raise is if a machine is so powerful to design another machine, and then this new machine goes on. You know? So this sort of short circuit, you know, this feedback loop, and uh, where does it lead? And they invented the name for the destination. They call it the singularity. So the singularity people is a strange crowd, you know, and there is the occasional philosopher and then an immense amount of all sorts of mixed bag of people. So I can't really take them too seriously. And yet the question is valid. So can there be a singularity? I, I don't know. I, the, the truth is that. Uh, um, we don't have a machine that makes machines. Although I was told the GPT-4 writes very good code, 
and uh, code-based programming. I mean. So it is not it is no longer unthinkable a, a language model that writes the code for another language model that is better. Well, it's not today, but it is no longer unthinkable. So the singularity people may become heartened and encouraged by this. And can there be an end to the process? Okay. I don't know, I don't know the answer. Okay, what, nobody's asking the question. So I'll have to ask the question. Tell us about the monkey and unintended consequences, please. Ah, the monkey and the paw. Yes, exactly. Thank you. I was hoping. Now I had the, uh, so that's a, 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 it's not even a Victoria. This is an Edwardian tale from 1902 by W.W. W. Jacobs. You read it, you like it. Yes. So I, I will tell it very badly. I apologize. And uh, um, there is this family with the, the family, they're called White, like at the Vice Chancellor of our university. There is Mr. White, and there is Mrs. White, and there is a child. And, um, and, um, and there is a friend who comes from India with a talisman, which is like this dried up, mummified monkey paw, which is said to be able to grant to wishes. And, um, and of course, the wise men over there warn them, don't use this because you shouldn't use this. But of course, they want to use it. And they have this powerful thing. And they want to play with it. And um, so Mr. White isn't sure. But Mrs. White thinks we really have to pay off the mortgage. And we are short of 200 pounds. And if you just wish for 200 pounds, we can sort out the house and so on and so forth. So they wish for 200 pounds. After a long mini argument, they wish. But nothing comes. The, the 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 hand does do something. Like it acknowledges that you know there is a feedback, but it doesn't do anything else. They go to sleep, poor as before, and the next morning they wake up and there is still no money. They are still equally poor, and the, nothing worked. And mid morning again, no money in the house. So they really believe the monkey paw doesn't work. However. At midday, lunchtime, some man comes from outside and starts very nervously hovering around the door. And then he knocks finally and they let him in. And he says, the factory sent me because there was a, an accident. And, uh, and um, the mother understands already everything. And, and, and um, he says, um, your son was caught in the, in the, in the machinery, in the, in the mechanics of the, of the steam engine. And they ask, how is he? And he says, well, it doesn't, he's no longer in pain. That's the answer. Mm -hmm. And then after a long silence, he says, I was uh, allowed by the owner to come here with the money to compense as a compensation for your loss. So they ask, how much? And the man says, it is 200 pounds. And then um, the story goes on because they try to use up the other wishes and it goes worse and worse and more and more horrific and it's a horror story. It's a gothic horror story from the Guardian Times. You don't want me to tell you. You should read it. It's a beautiful story. But um, this I like it because it gives me a chance to talk about cybernetics. The founder of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, was very, very fond of this story. He wrote a book in 1948 called Cybernetics and then another book in 1950 called on the human use of human beings, which is a very prescient book in which he talks about what could go wrong with this work he started. And he was repeating this story and saying, if we build a machine that is designed to be very clever and following and um, accomplishing the goals we give it, mm -hmm. it will not understand when it is, you know, um, violating some norms or some values along the way to accomplish the goal. For, for us, for example, it is not acceptable to kill somebody for 200 pounds, but for the machine, it was a reasonable strategy. It was told to deliver 200 pounds and it did. It could understand. It doesn't think in a human way. So not only I know winners books for a, since I was a student, but they came back to me when I read about Molly Russell. As we build a machine to make people click, well, this machine may just as well do whatever it takes to make people click. That's what we built it for. So all the warnings that Wiener wrote in the end of the last page of his book, that the time is running out and this thing is coming and one day this will happen, it might have happened. And the, the machine doesn't know if there is psychological well-being issues, addiction issues, 
we call it problematic use. Facebook calls it problematic use, which is self-control issues and so on. The machine can't understand if society is becoming polarized or if a child is becoming radicalized by the contents. There are stories of people who become extremely politically radicalized by virtue or the feedback loop they're exposed to. We don't know much about it yet, but the point is, if the machine is built to make people click, the rest doesn't matter. And that's what we learned from the monkey people. We don't know much, but there is a serious question that would be nice to answer. Yeah, absolutely. I think somebody else had a question here. Yeah. I'd like to ask um, what areas is, is AI weakest in and, have, and humans have the edge over it? Uh, what what is forward. weakest in and then? Yeah, what areas is AI weakest in? And where human beings are likely to right right to, to uh, yeah yeah i mean there are so many things we do that we don't need the, first of all we don't need the machines for many things and um, right now the body of the machine is very very clumsy and the, whatever that needs the body to start with needs a human body the machines are not very good however uh, there are companies who are developing robots for military use which might become one day quite useful for them, but they are not comparable to us. Currently, the general wisdom is that um, anything involving empathy, but I would warn against that because uh, it, you know, it, it could cut both ways. But right now, the understanding is a teacher, a nurse, a caregiver, a babysitter, whatever needs empathy fundamentally shouldn't easily be automated. Hopefully, we keep it that way. And then there are a lot of dexterity works. Have you noticed that there is no machine that does make up the hotel room, hairdressing, all this kind of stuff that we used to think are less clever than playing chess. Well, the chess player has been longer since automated. Go has been mathematical theory improving. Everything is being automated, but still nobody has a machine to have a haircut. Uh, so dexterity is very important. Compassion and, and human thing are very important. But, you know, don't underestimate our entrepreneurs. And there are people I heard who suggested something horrific. I can tell you, but then you're going to faint. Somebody told me, if we stick GPT in Alexa, Alexa is the machine that speaks to you, we can solve the problem of the care homes. And the old people can just talk to the machine and they will never know. And that is becoming quite heartbreaking. Yeah. So hopefully there will be stuff that, Okay, well, that's actually sort of getting us into the area that we haven't really discussed much. That's ethics, artificially, artificial intelligence ethics. Can you say a bit about that, where we are we with that? that. We, it was hidden everywhere. It was hidden everywhere. So ethics, bring, it, bring it to the surface. So ethics is not going to be what you learn in the ethics class 101, which is uh, always, believe me, by ethics book, there is a there is a trolley on it, on, there is a cart on a, on, a, on a railway, right? And then there is a switch, is it called a switch? And if you go left, if you do nothing, the trolley goes left and hits three children eating a sandwich. But you have the power to turn the switch and make the trolley go right, and then you hit two old ladies. Which one do you want to do? Do nothing, do something, kill one, kill the other. What is your choice? And that's the general discussion that you find when they discuss automated cars like Tesla that goes on its own. And they say, well, the Tesla will be like the trolley. There will be a person here, another dog there, and which one do you kill first, you know, and so on. Well, again, the way the machine is built, it will never come to represent this dilemma in its head. It no. doesn't have that. It's a series of reflexes. So the machine will not face the ethical question ever. The automatic gambling system that gets children addicted to gambling, will not face this dilemma. The ethics, if anything, is in the head of the regulators who have to decide um, what should be forbidden from the European market, for example, which is coming very soon and it's a 500 million wealthy customers. And when somebody decides you can't have face recognition in the street, you know that you're protecting people's privacy, but you're helping also some criminal. And that's the ethics not of the machine, of the lawmakers. Yeah, good. Now we've probably got time for one more question. Nobody has unmuted themselves and, and shown their, their screen online. So the last question may well go to someone in the audience, unless we 
Rapidad Abnal. One final burning question in the room. Burning question. No. Okay, well, look, then it's with, you know, thank you very much indeed, Nella, for a very engaging talk and an excellent uh, QA session. So please put your hands together for Nella Christiane. Just before you all go, just to let you know about something that's forthcoming uh, very shortly. Some of you have seen the, the flyer here for the World in 2050, which is a talk program of uh, eight talks discussing what the world will be like or could be like in 2050. And it is from an economic, from a political, from a social, mm -hmm. from a technological, and also from a climate and environmental perspective. And we have eight great speakers from around the world. Five of them will be here in the room and three will join us remotely by live streaming onto the big screen. A lady from Paris and two gentlemen from Germany. So have a look at that on the website or take the brochure with you. And uh, the only other thing is we have a lecture from Bath University coming on the 20th of June. Uh, carrying, the, carrying on with the theme of uh, uh, artificial intelligence to some extent and data, and she's going to talk about uh, the research she's done in terms of how much data our mobile phones give away about us and all to do with cybersecurity. So this is uh, a lady called Hannah Hutton from Bath University on the 20th of June. Hope to see you all for that and hope to see you all for the World in 2050 talk series and have a safe journey home. All the very best. <laughs>